Hi YouTube, it's Janelli here, also known as Miss Be Helpful. And in this video, I'm doing something a little bit different. I feel like right now during this time, while the Black Lives Matter movement is progressing, it's really important to take a stand against racism. And so I am posting this episode that I shared on the podcast. I took a break from interviewing somebody and I wanted to really focus on doing something that I could commit to myself that would make me better in some way in relation to this cause. So for me, that meant like, what are the things that I could do? I'm an educator. I specifically teach people about personal finance. So how can I connect those things to the issues that uh, black Americans are facing right now? Yeah. My, I mean, my call to action to you guys is listen to this episode because it is going to teach you so much, but also do more. This is not the only thing that, that we have to do. We have to really be reading. We have to be talking. We have to be doing more so that we're aware of exactly why these issues are coming to the, the forefront of our country and really demanding attention. We can't be comfortable with going back to normal because that, that shows that we're okay with the status quo. And right now, the status quo is not equitable for a lot of people walking around in this country specifically those who have dark skin. And so we have to take a stand against racism and we have to say that it's not okay. We can't continue to operate in a way where it's like, oh, well, you know, there's not much I can do. Yes, there is. There's a lot you can do. You can read more. You can educate yourself more. You can talk, have conversations and talk about it. You can also call up your local politicians and legislators and demand that there be, you know, changes made so that we can have a more equitable society. So hopefully this is an episode that teaches you something new. I did not record it live with myself on screen. So it's just the audio boom of the episode because it was very late at night and I was just raw telling everybody what I learned and how I felt about it. But I still hope that you get to enjoy it. And please share comments with me below. If you knew this already and you just enjoyed my passion telling the story, great, let me know. And if you didn't know, let me know because I wonder, you know, how many other people out there really didn't know the story of Freedman Savings Bank because it is an incredible story of the rise and fall of the first black bank in America. So I want you guys to enjoy the episode and that's all I have for you guys. So enjoy. What's up, everybody? This is Mind Your Money with Miss Be Helpful, a show that highlights people and stories that will inspire you to get your money right. Now, it's really hard for me right now to do this introduction because I usually come in with like all this high energy and I'm all excited and I'm always happy. But if I did that right now, it would just be faking the funk because it's it's hard. It's like I'm going through social media and I'm seeing posts of all these protests and people are trying to protest peacefully. But of course, you know, things escalate and you're outside and there's so many people and, and there's so many violent interactions happening. So what we're seeing is more police brutality. And, you know, the whole reason why people are protesting is to see less of that and to demand less of that. And it's just really, um, you know, it's a scary thing to see every time I get on social media. And I just feel like right now is a time to try to speak up about what is going on. So I'm taking a little break from having a guest on the show. I was supposed to have Vanessa from Wander Onwards this week, but I'm going to push her to next week because I really want to take time to do a show where I'm talking about what I'm really thinking about and what I'm doing to personally do my part. I've already posted a little bit on Instagram about it, but I wanted to do a little bit more because I just feel like everybody needs to do their part. And while I have this audience and this platform, which I think is a beautiful gift and a blessing, I really do want to use it correctly. And I want to try to do the best that I can do personally with, with what I have. And so what I want to talk about is how um, everything that I am personally about, right? Money um, and personal finance education and, and how that crosses over, bleeds over with, um, you know, Black America and Black Americans specifically in this country. Because what's happening right now with the Black Lives Matter movement is a lot of people are saying, you know, oh, all lives matter. And it's important for us to all, you know, come together. And of course, nobody's saying that those things aren't true. But the point is right now, we have to try to understand what the plight is that Black Americans are experiencing and Black people across the world, honestly, if we're being real, uh, racism is a, is a global issue. And so I personally was very curious because I know a little bit about things in our history, like redlining and stuff like that. And, you know, injustices that black people have faced in our country specifically. But I wanted to know a little bit more. So I did a little bit of digging and I wanted to share the story that I found out, um, which basically starts a little bit after um, the Civil War. It's when like the 13th Amendment happened. And by the way, if you guys have not seen 13th on um, Netflix, you have to see it. It is incredible. And 
it's basically about the 13th Amendment, which is when slavery was abolished. And, you know, this happened in like 1860s, right? So this is like super early, uh, you know, when, of course, like there was not a lot of the systems that we know of. The way America is now, it was very different back then, obviously, because slavery was still going on and had just been, uh, you know, established in the law as being not legal, right? So uh, you got all these people, uh, Black Americans, who were enslaved. And then one day to the next, it was like, okay, now you're freed Black people, supposedly. I mean, a lot of them were not technically free, but you know, the law said that, right? So now the immediate things you would think people who were just freed from slavery, what are the things that they're going to need? Well, they're going to need food. They're going to need clothes. They're going to need shelter. They're going to need medicine, right? The basics, like things that we need for survival. Okay. Yes. But everybody knew like eventually down the line, there are going to be more needs, like more robust needs. Like we, we're a, a, a society that's a little complex, right? Like we need, we need banks, we need financial services, we need legal services, we need education, we need, you know, they're going to have access to money now because they're free. They're going to be able to go work. And so they're going to need a place to put that money, a safe place to keep that money. So, you know, basically Congress kind of decided like, all right, this is a time where we're going to need to create a social service to support all of these black people who were uh, formerly enslaved and need a place to, you know, learn about financial education and place to literally put their money and keep it safe. So they created this uh, bureau and the, the government, Congress literally created something called Freedmen's Bureau, literally freed man, like men who were freed. And so Freedmen's Bureau basically offers social services to black people. And, you know, they put this, the, the first thing that this bureau put in place was a bank, bank, a bank called Freedmen's Savings Bank. So this, again, 1865, right? This is the year that the bank was created. So now I, when I was reading about this, I'm like, wait, how, I mean, if you open a bank and you just have all these people who were literally just enslaved, so they ain't got no money, like, what are they going to need a bank for, right? Like, that was my my initial reaction. But that that is wrong because I had no idea the amount of people who were enslaved that were actually in the army. Like, if you don't know this stuff, I, I don't blame you. I didn't know any of this stuff because I didn't learn this stuff in school. A lot of times, public school curriculum does not include things like this. And so per personally, me, I went to public schools my whole life. I went to Brown University and I took a class on uh, African-American education in the U.S., but I never actually really learned about slaves that actually were in the army fighting during the civil war, like all of these specific things. Like I'm sure I was aware of it, but I just didn't know the numbers, the masses. Right. And so this large number of, you know, formerly enslaved people who were in the army, all of a sudden the civil war is over and they're now like sent home as free people. They got paychecks from their service in the army and they're like, okay, what are we going to do with all this money? This is the first time that they have money. They, obviously they're going to need a place to put it. And so they're like, all right, we're going to go to this bank that was specifically created for black people who were for just freed. And it was also providing basic financial education. It wasn't just like, oh, put your money here and give us money. And we're going to give you services. They were also teaching, you know, um, blacks the, the, the things that they needed, the basics of financial education so that they understood how to use the bank. Because if you never have money, all of a sudden you got money and you go into a bank, that doesn't mean you're going to know exactly what to do. I mean, I go to schools all the time and I talk to kids and, you know, young um, kids, preteens, middle school, high schools. And a lot of times these kids will literally raise their hand and be like, miss, how do you put money into a bank account? And like, when you're trying to get the money out of the bank, how do you get the money outside of the bank? Do you have to go in there every time you need to get your money out? Like, they, if you don't know, you don't know. And so these people literally had no conception or knowledge of how banks work, how financial institutions work. So, okay, so Freedman Savings Bank is like there to teach them that and also to help them literally save their money. And so now it's like, all right, cool. We, we go here and we learn. Everything is going well. They're, they're learning. They are saving money. And again, I, I'm talking about like a lot of people. Like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the specific numbers and I'm, I, I could have looked it up. I should have looked it up. And I, I feel like I, I'm missing this information here to talk about how exactly how many people, uh, you know, came back as uh, free people after the war. But the point is millions of dollars were put into Freedman Savings Bank, millions of dollars from tens of thousands of people. So of course, seeing millions of dollars coming in, the bank got hyped. The bank got overhyped because they're seeing all this money. Cha-ching, cha-ching, ching. They just see dollar signs, right? So now they're spreading this money out. They're like, oh, let's open a location in Washington, D.C., right? The nation capital. Are we going to go and put buildings, banks everywhere, physical banks, so that we can have more customers, right? We're going to have black people from everywhere that are now free are going to start using these services, right? 
But just like banks today being a hot ass mess, they, there was a lot of mismanagement of the money. Now, there's a lot of different things out there about what exactly happened. But the, the, the point is, is it was mismanaged. OK, just some things never changed. These banks are a hot mess. They can't get enough of the money. They're so greedy. They want more and more and more. And we're talking about. Back again, I want to remind you guys, this is the 1870s now at this point, right? Because 1865 is when the bank opened, you know, now five years, six years later, people are putting money and everything's going well. All of a sudden you got an economic downturn in the 1870s. There was like, I don't remember specifically the years, 1872, 1873, 1874, one of those early years in the 1870s, there was a panic, like a, um, basically like what happened in 08, what happened right now because of coronavirus, it wasn't health related, but there was an economic downturn just like now, like these things happen. It's the economic cycle. There's good times. There's a, you know, a bull market and then there's bad times. There's a bear market. And so in the early 1870s, there, it was basically a panic. Okay, the money was tight. the na- The national economy was a hot as mess. Okay, so basically, it was just like, all right. So now we got these people at the top who are corrupt, you know, and and this was there was no FDIC. So we got people putting money in a bank. Black people who were just freed putting their money into a bank, being told that they're going to be taught financial education, that they're going to be protected as the social service that's there to help them and to, you know, develop them and now people are being a hot mess, money is being mismanaged. And it's just so sad. Like you, you think about how the story ends. I mean, I'm not going to jump too fast forward too fast, but like basically because there's no FDIC insurance, you, you that's the hint, right? You kind of know where the story is going. You, you get the point. There was no protection. So, you know, they, they are basically realizing that the bank is in hot water. They're about to like be bankrupt. Literally don't have, they're, they're making terrible decisions with money. They don't have enough capital to keep the, the banks open, that they have opened too many locations way too fast. They put thinking that they're, you know, balling out of control because money's coming in. And then and then they found themselves really in a position where they clearly were uh, above their budget. And so now they're like tight and they're freaking out because they're like, oh, man, we we're in a recession right now or, you know, an economic downturn or whatever you want to call it. And so now people are probably freaking out. We can't have all these black people who just put all this money in this bank, take it out because they're getting panicked. So what we need to do is we need to do something quick to get them to trust us and keep their money in the bank with us. So what do they do? They go and they hire Frederick Douglass to be the president of Freedman Savings Bank. Because if black people see one of their own at the top, maybe they will trust the bank, right? This is so manipulative and you know, I, I don't know t- I like a ton about this period of time, but from what I'm reading and what I've learned, it's just like s- so manipulative to get somebody like Frederick Douglass, who clearly was very well respected at that time by other black people and to put him in a position of leadership, hype him up to make him have all this hope in the future of this bank that he's about to run. He can, you know, change the bank's future. He can, you know, change the game and, and make it, you know, good things happen. But no, they knew, they knew they were messing up in the back end with everything going on with the bank. They knew that bank was going to go down. And so it's just so sad. And basically, long story short, what this led to was 61,100 people, over more than that, but that's the rough estimate, right? 61,100 people completely lost their money. And these are not just quote unquote people, like in general, we're talking about black people who were formerly enslaved. So we're talking about black Americans, 61,100 of them put their money in an institution, a financial institution created by Congress, American Congress. Okay. And three million dollars worth of their money was gone. Now, in 2020, that three million dollars would be worth $64,097,250. Because yes, you better believe I went and I checked online with an inflation calculator because I'm that nerdy, yes, okay? And I wanted to know exactly how much would $3 million from 1873 be in 2020? $64,097,250. And that is just inflation. 
That does not even count the interest that might have accrued on the savings. Because when you put your money in a bank, in a savings account, you know you get interest on that money. You get a little return. I mean, it's not a lot, but something is something. And when it compounds and compounds and compounds over hundreds of years, okay, it's a lot of money. And so we're talking about so much money stolen from black people and literally just wiping them clean. And and they waited years and years and years, waited and waited to see if they would get something back from the bank. And a small piece of what was owed to them was paid back. Now, I have not seen specific numbers in what I've read so far, but it doesn't matter. Like you had them waiting years and then you only give them a fraction of what was lost. Like honestly, too little, too late. They should have had their money literally the day that the bank shut down. They should have had something. So this is just to me, it was just like I have I never knew this story of Freeman Savings Bank. And if you knew this already, amazing. I'm so happy that you knew this. I learned this recently, which is why I wanted to share it. And if you think other people that you know don't know this, please share this with them because what this is, it is so important because this is an example of how early, early, early we're talking about back in the 1860s, 1870s, when you know, it's, these things happened. It's basically proving and showing signs of how the American government, the systems that we have created since day one, since early, okay, have put black people in a position where they are behind in a race that they didn't even know they were running in. And it's just so unfair. Now, you guys. I, I did definitely did not do this story justice. Like there's so many details, there's so much more information. So I'm going to link like a few different resources in the show notes for this episode, because I definitely encourage you guys to go read more about uh, Freedman Savings Bank and everything that happened during this time. But, you know, ba- basically I just want to fast forward to today, right? Because we got this wealth gap in the U.S., 10x, okay? We got black families with an average net worth of $17,150, Okay, and then white families with an average net worth of one hundred and seventy one thousand dollars, basically about 10, 10 times more. Okay, for a white family's average net worth compared to a black family. So that's from like 2017. Okay, but that's like the most recent data that I found. Black people been out here, been out here trying to build wealth, actively trying to build wealth for hundreds of years. You know, and I'm talking about 1876. Fast forward a little bit to 1921. You got Black Wall Street destroyed completely in Tulsa. I think it was Green Greenville or Greenwood, Greenwood District. Okay, something else that if you're not familiar with, you got to read about that. And then later on, you got Jim Crow laws, which literally did not allow black people to have wealth building opportunities, especially in the South. Okay, if you don't know about redlining, you don't know what I'm talking about with this. You, oh my God, turn this podcast off literally right now. You have my permission to cut me off. Stop listening to this and go right now and read ta Coates. He has an incredible, phenomenal, I mean, life change. It will literally make you cry. It is an incredible piece written in the Atlantic. It's called The Case for Reparations. And it focuses on redlining practices in America, which literally did not allow black people to get a mortgage to get properties in this country. They, could, they couldn't get a house. Like, imagine you go to a bank right now and you ask them to get to sit down and talk to you about a mortgage. And they say, you cannot get a mortgage because of the color of your skin. That is literally what was happening, okay? And this was when slavery was already not legal. Okay, we're talking about Jim Crow era. So we're not talking about no 1860s, 1870s. We're talking about this was just a few decades ago. Like, generations of people that are alive today, the older generations, they were alive during this time. Okay. So this is talking about recent history. And there's a man highlighted in that article, Clyde Ross, I think his name is, and he was trying to get a mortgage very early on, couldn't get it because he was black. Most black people were just not allowed to get houses to not own to, to, they were not allowed to own property. Okay. Because they were black. So all of this to say, like, basically from all of these examples, I mean, there's so many more examples, but these are just basic ones that I'm listing here to show that wealth time and time and time and time again in the U.S., wealth has been taken from black people before it even got a chance to grow into anything substantial and anything real. And, you know, it's not like, and I hate when I hear people say, oh, 
It's not like that anymore. That's the past. Why are you focusing on that? That's the happened already. Like this is the, the present time 2020. Like, let me tell you something. The past is, is our history. And this history matters for today's conversation about inequality, what's happening in America today, because the impact of that stuff, the negative side effects from that were passed down from generation to generation to generation. And I'm not talking about like the mentality. I'm talking about physical assets that like are passed down, properties, bank accounts, investment funds, inheritances, okay, being passed down. White families have been passing it down from generation to generation to generation. And the same counterparts, right? The black grand, great, 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 great grandparents in, in that, back in that time had no properties, no bank accounts, no investment funds, no inheritance, nothing to pass down. So they got nothing to pass down from to the, to the next generation while they're competing with white people that were able to get properties, to get those mortgages, to create those investment accounts, to put money in the savings account and have it be there when you come back for it. Like basic things that people do with money today and take for granted. So this, this matters today. This matters. And for me, why it matters so much more is because I'm always talking about the wealth gap. Like there's a wealth inequality, wealth gap not so much the income gap. I'm not talking about the income gap. No, because the income gap is not focused on wealth. It's focused on your paychecks that you get from your job, income that families make. And this is way beyond income. You guys, this is about wealth. When you have wealth, we're talking about like income is nothing. It's not even a big deal. If you lose your income when you have wealth, it's like, it's like an annoyance. It's like if I try to go walk to a restaurant in my neighborhood and they're closed. I'm like, oh, I mean, coronavirus right now. But like, whatever. If I go on Seamless and I try to order some food and it says the restaurant is not open right now. I'm like, oh, gosh, that's so annoying. All right. Well, I can order again tomorrow. That's what it's like for wealthy people who have wealth to not be able to have income anymore, to like lose their source of income from their job. They're like, oh, what a oh, so inconvenience. OK, because wealth is a safety net. Wealth is like inheriting a freaking house or building in a safe neighborhood from your grandparents who passed it to your parents who now gave it to you. So you got access to the good schools in that neighborhood. You got access to that beautiful property that you didn't have to do anything for. It was just given, given to you. You inherited it. And now you get to pass that property down to your kids because your parents gave it to you. Now you get to give it to your kids and your kids will give it to their kids. And oh, that's so beautiful. Wealth makes that. that. That's wealth. Wealth is what's happening right there. And the difference between wealth and income that is even more important than anything that I've said is that wealth generates returns. Income does not. Okay. Wealth is literally sitting in stocks, bonds, real estate. Okay. These houses, these buildings, and that has capital gains. That means that all these things that are being inherited have been sitting for years and for generations growing. And that growth, that capital gains that, that grows on it, on those investments, is not taxed at the same rate as the income, okay, that we earn when we go work a regular, regular job. Right. So we go to work, we get our paycheck. Our paychecks are taxed at much higher rates. The income taxes that we pay are so much higher than wealth tax. So I, it's like I can't talk enough about how this matters so much today. It matters. It's so much. It's so part of the conversation, which is why I went digging a little bit because I wanted to find out more information. And I hope this is interesting to you guys, too, because it should be. It should be something that you really care about because it, it's it matters to everybody that we understand what is happening in our country. Why? Why is it possible that in 2020, a black family's average net worth is 10 times less than a white family's average net worth. It, like how? We have to be doing the work to find out what is going on in the country. Okay. And so I don't want to end this episode with like, a, oh, look at all these problems in our country. It's so complicated. Now go be depressed. Like, it, yes, it, it, this is, it's, it's difficult stuff to hear. It's difficult to learn about it. It's, it's hard to, you know, like to ingest this, like it hurts. And it's, it's like, what do I do? Like, What's going to happen next to fix this? There's so much wrong. What what can happen? And I, and I I don't know. I'm not a an economist. I'm not an expert in a lot of different things. But I think just basically from what I've shared today, I think a basic small offering is that income from inheritance, from wealth, and from these kinds of things like passed down from generation to generation, 
it needs to be more equitable compared to what you're taxing income, especially because more people who don't have access to wealth are being taxed on income and and literally don't get capital gains. So they don't they don't even have the opportunity to get capital gains tax like they're not they don't have access to that. Whatever is happening uh, when you get capital gains and it's, it's getting taxed. It needs to be changed. It needs to be improved. It needs to be updated, renovated for 2020. Like, you know, and even taxes on wealth could be like part of the solution. I think like if you have a bunch of money sitting somewhere, it need, like these things are not new ideas. OK, people have been talking about this stuff. It's all out there already. You know, a lot of the political candidates recently have been saying this kind of stuff. But what what the, what I don't think is actually happening is that people are not actually taking it seriously, you know, and that's the frustrating thing. So. You know, if you have, you know, a lot of st- like stuff in an estate, taxes on an estate or on an inheritance, that could really, that could really change the opportunities that people have. Like it can really, really, really change things, especially if the money that you were getting from the taxes w- were used for programs that could give other people better chances at economic success. I mean, redistribution of wealth. I mean, whatever. These are obviously very progressive ideas, okay? And y'all who know me, if you've been listening to myself, if you watch my content, you know that I'm a progressive person. But I really do think, like, if you understand the history, if you understand where we're coming from, then you're going to have a better view of where the country needs to go to try to rectify some of the things that have happened in our history that we should not be very proud of. And Obviously, the actual people living today were not here at that time and don't have anything to do with those things, but we're here now and we just have to do what we can with what we have now. So I don't know. I hope that this episode was intriguing to you. I hope you learned something new. I'm going to link everything that I um, talked about, that that I've read, where I got this information from, the ta Coates article and Everything else that I've been posting on Instagram, if you follow me on Instagram, um, related to, uh, you know, uh, anti-racist uh, concepts, principles and beliefs and ideas, I am going to post all of those things in the box, in the, what do you call it? I was going to say description box because <laughs> I'm a YouTuber, but in the show notes for this episode. Um, but that's it, you guys. I just want to share those things with you and hope that it resonates with you the way that it resonated with me. I definitely have a new perspective on some of the political beliefs that I've held. And, um, you know, and I think it's important for us to to really understand, um, you know, why our country is where it is today and why all these issues are continuing to come up again and again and again, because these are not the first um, protests about police brutality and uh, racial inequality in this country. So, when is something actually going to change, right? We have to um, we have to do something different if we want a different result. The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Okay, I'm sure you've seen that quote somewhere. And in, in, in we need to do something different. So I'm doing something different with the podcast, and I hope that you guys liked it. I hope it was something informative. Um, I do have a quick ask for you guys this week. I have been posting every single week, which has been amazing. It's been so fun connecting with the women that I've connected with so far. And I promise you guys, a lot of the guys out there, fellas that are listening, y'all like, yo, what up? Where are the men at? I promise I got some of my brothers coming on the show soon. But right now it's just been strictly girls. And it's just been so fun to talk to these ladies about um, their stories. Um, but we've been doing all this work, putting these stories out here. And I haven't reminded you guys ever, since the intro episode, I have not brought it up again that rating the show and leaving a review is so hugely helpful because again, it helps to put the show on the radar of people that are listening. So if you're new and you're on Spotify or podcast app and you're going through and you're looking for content, like it's not going to pop up for you if, if it doesn't have really good ratings. Okay. So every possible review, every possible rating that pops up that can come in is so, so, so helpful. So please take a second. If you have not already in iTunes, um, if you have an iPhone, go and and just leave a quick review and let people know why you've been tuning in, what you think of the show and um and give it some stars, five stars preferably, but you know however many stars you want to give it, okay? And 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 that is just something that I really really appreciate. On YouTube it's the same thing. I always ask people to give videos a thumbs up and to subscribe because those are the types of things that really do matter in terms of helping the videos get suggested to other people. So same thing with podcasts, okay? You guys this really helps me out. And um yeah, I think it just it's also really good for people to, to when they go 
do find it and they go and look at the reviews to see those comments and be like, oh, okay, maybe I should check it out. Like if you're on the fence and you're like, should I listen or not? Your review could be the make or break. It could really help somebody make the decision to give it a listen. So I really do appreciate it. Um, but that is all that I have for you guys this week. Please be safe out there. Please do this work, you guys. Don't If you're uncomfortable about these conversations and everything that's happening in the social media and, and in the news and in our literally in our physical uh, cities and towns and spaces right now, like challenge that. Okay. Lean into that discomfort and learn more and try to be better. I think that is just all that we can do. Um, you know, in the time that, that we're experiencing right now with the health crisis and with, uh, all of the racial, uh, tension happening and all of the, uh, demand for, for better, um, you know, for a better country. So I think, you know, do what you can. I'm trying to do what I can. Thank you so much for listening. And, uh, hopefully you'll come back next week for a new episode on Monday. If you like this video, which I'm sure you did because the video was the bomb, then you're going to want to watch all the other episodes of the Mind Your Money with Miss Be Helpful podcast. And they're all right here in this playlist. So click the playlist to watch those episodes. And if you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Click the subscribe button right now so you can get videos every single week and to join Team Be Helpful right here. That's all I have for you guys. Till next time, peace.